Good morning. This is the oxyacetylene welding and cutting equipment lecture by Ruth Shepherdson at Plateau Valley High School. Our objective today is to review um, and, and really make sure that you can identify and describe all the uses for the equipment and materials um, in the oxyacetylene welding and cutting process. As you well know, in this class, we will begin with cutting and follow up with welding. So we'll focus more on the cutting process and cutting equipment today. Why do we use oxyacetylene? Oxygen and acetylene, when combined, create one of the hottest flames um, for use that is manageable. It runs at about 3,100 degrees. Um, this process over the years has been used in a mechanized and a manual sort of fashion. Um, we can do it when it doesn't require electricity. This is important to us in rural areas because oftentimes we need to repair equipment or corrals or fencing um, in very rural places without electricity. So our options are to use a heat source like this or um, bring a generator. Early in industrial times, this is, was a very inexpensive process, and that's actually um, what brought it to the front along with its um, ability to create a hot flame. We have found now that um, several plants that create the calcium carbonate needed to make acetylene have either gone out of business or closed or um, one of them actually blew up outside Louisville. Um, and so we see many businesses switching to the use of propane. So most of what we can talk about today could also be applied to oxy fuel cutting and welding. When we switch to propane, we see that hottest flame upper end drop um, ever so slightly, the, about the hottest flame you can get from that is 2,800 degrees. That being said, in many situations, that is still a sufficient heat of flame to do the cutting you need. In your oxy fuel welding and, and cutting setup, we see two main cylinders, your oxygen and your fuel gas. In this case, we're gonna talk about acetylene. Both of those cylinders need to have regulator, regulators on them and good hoses to transport the gas. When we look at the, the health of those hoses, we're looking to replace them every um, probably 10 to 15 years just to prevent cracking and leaking. Um, they're made of rubber, um, but if they have been outside or weathered, we oftentimes see some repairs needed there. There is a torch or welding and cutting tips then attached to the torch body. And finally, we wanna have a tip cleaner handy so that you have appropriately clean equipment. Um, in many situations, you will need an added welding rod. We've talked many times about your personal protective equipment, so I'm not gonna to dwell too long on that. Um, you do need eye protection when you are oxy fuel welding and cutting between the shades of five and eight. We use a striker to start the oxy um, cutting or welding process. And many people ask to have a soapstone there so that they can draw lines to follow. When we look at the oxygen cylinder, it's important for you to know that these are pressurized cylinders. That makes them a little bit more dangerous. That also makes them um, highly effective. In the oxygen cylinder, we're storing 98% oxygen. The pressure lingers somewhere in the 2000 um, PSI. It's a tank that's made out of quarter inch high carbon armor plate steel. Um, in the last few years, we've actually had a little bit of a hard time getting more cylinders. There's been a little bit of a shortage just because of workplace shortages um, in making them. They have to be made in a very particular way to ensure safety. That cylinder valve on top of it is an interesting valve that's actually got several safety features built into it. The first, I apologize for the sound effects in this uh, PowerPoint. I thought they were taken out, but I must not have saved that. Until. So it will just annoy you and keep you awake the whole time. The first is that oxygen cylinders have a back seating valve. And so as you look at the very top of this valve, you can see that when we um, open the valve, that then applies pressure and opens 
um, the valve really so that air can come out. The second is that it has a built-in safety disc. And you see that off to the left of your diagram. That safety disc is actually under the valve. Um, that's built very purposefully. The safety disc melts at a certain temperature and allows the gas to escape slowly rather than blow up like a bomb. Um, I've oftentimes in class quoted um, James Bond movies or, or things you might see in a James Bond movie. We know that the top of the cylinder is one of the most um, safety conscious places because if it breaks off, that cylinder acts as a rocket and can injure and kill people. Next, let's talk about acetylene. Acetylene gas is produced when you um, have a chemical combination of calcium carbide and water. Its chemical formula is C2H2. When we store acetylene gas, it is not safe above pressures of 15 PSI. Now there is, is no guaranteed response above 15 PSI. And so what we say is that that gas is very volatile. We don't know what it's going to do. Because of that, we only use acetylene gas under the pressure of 15 PSI. In order for us to store that much acetylene in a cylinder, there are a couple of things that are added to that cylinder to keep it safe. Um, one is that we pump the acetylene gas in to a filler material that I visualize as looking a little bit like Swiss cheese. It has pores all over it. We know that acetylene kind of sticks to surfaces, if you will. It's one of its its properties is that it is a gas that likes to stick to a surface. And so it lines the ins and outs of all those pores. And then that acetylene gas isn't held in big pockets. It's dispersed throughout the filler material. They then charge the cylinder with acetone, which absorbs the acetylene. Um, acetone, or I'm sorry, acetylene molecules fit in between the acetone molecules. So again, that spreads them out and makes them more manageable. It also makes the acetylene come out of the tank a little bit slower and safer. Um, we know that acetylene expands pretty rapidly as temperature rises. And so in the base of an acetylene cylinder, you actually will see two fuse plugs um, that are threaded in and a fuse plug will melt again at, at a high temperature, which allows the gas to escape in a controlled manner rather than explode. Um, the question becomes, and, and ag teachers all over the state argue about this, how much should you open an acetylene valve? For years, I've taught that you only open it half a turn because then you are able to turn that bottle off quickly should you have an acetylene leak. It is still important for you to know that if there is an acetylene leak or any sort of fire danger, the response you should have is to quickly turn that bottle off and evacuate the building. However, um, I've learned later in my career that the way acetylene valves are built, it actually really damages it to not open it all the way. So we're going to adjust the slide to say more like one full turn or two full turns um, and then know that in a safety um, compromise situation, you would want to turn that off very quickly. We're not going to talk long about how you estimate the amount of charge left in a bottle um, because it's actually pretty difficult to do. Um, you sometimes can't just look at the gauge on the regulator because um, the acetylene and acetone and pore space um, goes in a, in a rate that it doesn't accurately tell you how much is actually left in the bottle. Um, acetylene is actually also affected by the temperature of the room that you hold it in. Colder temperatures mean that it comes out of the bottle slower. Um, one time when I taught at Fruta, I thought I was out of acetylene every morning at eight o'clock all winter. Um, the, my teaching partner would go out at two o'clock and tell me I was nuts because acetylene was coming out of the bottle just fine. It had to do with the temperature at 8 a.m. all winter. Um, acetylene can't be withdrawn any faster than it can be released from the acetone. This is an important fact to know because if you have an acetylene tank hooked up to a manifold where several stations are pulling off of it, that might affect you. The safe rate for drawing acetylene out of a cylinder is only one seventh of the cylinder at a time. There's that annoying sound effect again, I apologize. 
Quick reminder, when you store bottles of oxygen and acetylene, we really want to focus in on three things. The first is that the bottles should always be stored upright. The second is that they should be chained. And the third is that if they are not in use, they should have a cap on. Um, when you can't store an acetylene bottle upright, for example, um, I have to turn them horizontal to um, haul them here, you should make sure that when you take them out, you kind of set them upright, tap them on the bottom, and then let them sit for about an hour before you use them. That will help the acetylene settle and redisperse. Um, we know from the health department that we try hard not to um, strap oxygen and acetylene bottles together except when in use, and that's just because together they are more volatile than apart. When you are changing a bottle in a manifold setup, um, you typically crack the valve to blow out a tiny bit of dust that it can accumulate up inside the cap before you attach the regulator. The health and cleanliness of the, those bottle valves are pretty important. At the top of each cylinder, we see a regulator. Um, we've spoken in class about how we want to know that those, what those two gauges mean. The gauge closest to where the line or the, the hose comes out of the regulator is going to be your line pressure gauge. The gauge closest to where you are connected to the bottle or the manifold is the pressure of the gas in that holding capacity. So your operating pressure is on the left in this picture, your bottle pressure on the right. The adjusting screw is in the middle, um, and so we call this whole setup the regulator. That adjusting screw is how you determine um, how much gas comes out of the bottle. Just to take a moment to look at a flashback arrestor. A flashback arrestor is um, attached between the regulator and the hose. This prevents gas from ever um, entering back into the bottles. Um, there are rare situations in which um, gas can actually be flashed back into the bottle and be very dangerous if we don't have a flashback effect arrestor. Um, they're designed with a one directional check valve, and so they can they sense when there is a higher pressure and can prevent explosions. Talk briefly about welding hoses. Um, we know that oxygen hoses are always green, acetylene hoses are always red. It's actually impossible to switch those because of the direction of the threads. Oxygen hoses also have a right hand, always have a right hand thread. Acetylene hoses have this little tiny notch on the nut and that communicates to you that they are a reverse thread or a left-handed thread. It's pretty important for you to note that. Um, you, you look a little bit silly when you try to put a, an acetylene hose on with a right hand thread for a while, um, but just know throughout the industry that little notch on the nut tells you that. There are actually different types and sizes of welding hoses. They run anywhere from 3 16 a, a real small hose, on up to a 5 16 inch. They typically are sold in lengths of 25 feet. And all of this is dependent on the setup that you are putting them on. An oxyacetylene torch consists of a few parts. Um, we have a, the threaded ends that attach to the hoses and then the the end that attaches to the the tips and so on that torch body um, we can apply both a cutting head or a welding tip and then at the top of this picture you see a heating tip which is commonly called a rosebud welding tips are made of copper um, we know that this conducts heat well um, it also prevents overheating because of the way that it disperses heat. Tips come in a variety of sizes. Um, the zero is the, it's the smallest tip. I think you can actually get a double aught now um, on up to four, which is the largest. Um, tips have this little heat resistant um, gasket to seal up between the tip and the torch. It's important for you to know that that's there because it does age over time and sometimes needs replaced. Um, you should not ever use a wrench putting on a welding tip. You should always hand tighten it. And we always revise that to say Mrs. Shepherdson hand type, hand tight. 
not Jack Shepherdson hand type. He tends to have way too strong of hands and doesn't do a good job of moderating that. So the goal is just to have it seat in there correctly and seal. Um, copper and, and bronze are rather um, soft and malleable. So tightening them too tight will then make them have to be tightened that tight every time. One of the things you need to get in regular um, routine of is cleaning the tip every day before you weld. Because we have carbon deposits as a byproduct of oxyacetylene welding, they get inside the torch head and torch tip. And so we want to use a tip cleaner, which is actually just a very small round um, file. And you you can see that you put that in the middle cutting orifices, not the ones around the edge. Um, you, you kind of push that in and out and that files off any carbon. And then you use the file that's attached to it to take care of the end of the tip. Finally, you should run just a little bit of oxygen through it to blow any particulates out before you begin. We're not gonna to talk too much about welding rod today um, because we're gonna do that in the welding unit, but there are situations in which you add rod so that you can um, create um, the filler rod needed in a weld. We talked about a striper, striker. Um, I put this on here because I, I think it's a great glimpse back into history. Um, you never use your match or cigarette lighter or one textbook actually even said your cigarette to light the torch. Um, the idea is that we want a rather controlled lab station. And so the striker is the safest way to do that because it just emits one or two sparks at a time. Um, the more common problem I've seen is people actually um, starting their gases and then reaching over and letting those gases light off somebody else's torch flame. That is not safe to your classmates and your Benchmates, it is definitely something that I do not want you to do and will do something about if I see it in the lab. So be safe, be respectful to your classmates. We worked yesterday in the lab and I wanna just remind you and maybe have you record this in your notes um, on the types of flames. When we have the flame um, perfectly balanced, we call that a neutral flame. It has the proper proportions of both oxygen and acetylene. It creates a nice glossy puddle and it burns at about 5,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Occasionally we have too much acetylene in that flame. We call that a carburizing flame. Um, when your flame is carburizing, which you will need to make it so before you can make it neutral so that you can see what you're doing, you can see that inner cone, the acetylene feather and an outer cone this flame can be really harmful to the carbon in the metal. So you don't cut with this flame. On the other side of the equation, we have an oxidizing flame. This means you have an excess of oxygen. The inner cone gets quite a bit smaller. You're gonna hear a difference in the noise level because of the oxygen being forced through those lines. And when you begin cutting, you'll notice that your puddle gets kind of out of control and bubbly. It's not the most effective way to cut. Um, these are coming off a welding tip, so it's going to be just a little bit different because you're not going to see all the parts of the cutting flame, but you'll notice the difference in the colors for sure. That top picture shows you just acetylene burning, but then when we begin to feather in the oxygen, you can see the parts, the cone and the feather. When we have a neutral flame, that kind of um, inner feather disappears because you've aligned it with the cone. Um, and then if you don't have the right amount of acetylene, you have too much oxygen, you can see what an oxidizing flame looks like. Now for the cutting process, we have a um, jet of oxygen that comes through the center of the tip that actually blows away the molten metal and that's what creates your kerf. So um, visualize yourself um, lighting your torch, getting it to a neutral flame, um, then you are going to um, keep the tip perpendicular to the steel, and you're going to point it slightly in your direction of travel. This is really hard to articulate over a video, so we will work on this in person, but, but there's one angle we're looking at where you need to make sure you stay perpendicular. That makes your cut straight. But if you don't have your torch 
turned in the direction of travel, um, you're going to see your puddle disappear and you'll lose your ability to cut. The best mark of whether or not you're cutting at the appropriate speed, angle, and distance away from the metal is that that steady stream of sparks when you push the oxygen lever should pass through the plate as your cut proceeds and you move forward. This is a cross section of the torch. Um, this particular picture has a welding tip on it, so you can kind of ignore that. But you can see that um, inside we have, if you go to the very right hand side of the video, um, that's where you turn on your oxygen and acetylene. You can see that in the body is um, kind of where things come through in terms of the gases. And then there's that small mixing chamber up there kind of behind the union nut. That's where your gases mix and come out the welding tip. We light that flame on the outside and that's what makes us be able to use these two gases safely. When we are cutting, we wanna pay attention to the um, tip size. And so you'll see that in the second row, we correspond those with the thickness of material. And so you will notice that we'll be cutting fairly thin stuff, especially at first. Um, you're going to work most in double aughts or aught tips um, because we'll be cutting pretty thin stuff. It tells you your um, upper edge of what you need for oxygen pressure and then also your range for acetylene. The cutting speed is, is more if you have a motorized sort of thing where you set a machine at a right cutting speed. It's in inches per minute. Um, you may have noticed that your hand doesn't have a place to input that request, and so you're going to have to learn to do that yourself. We're running a little bit short on time, but I just want to let you take a glance at these so that you've seen them before. This is how things look um, from, from the very front of the oxyacetylene cutting torch. You can see that there's a middle cutting hole and the preheat holes around the edge. The cutting hole is where the extra oxygen is forced through. You can see in the picture on the left that perpendicular angle that I'm talking about. So direction of travel but also perpendicular. However, when you move on to the next assignment and you have to do a beveled cut, we move out of that perpendicular status to a 45 degree angle, but we keep our direction of travel. I will make your brain explode just a little bit, but trust me with some practice, you're gonna do a great job. Last thing I wanna look at is the quality of cuts. As you well know in this class, you'll be responsible for meeting with me to grade each of your cuts. We're gonna take a good solid look at the kerf on these cuts. And so you can see here we go everything from excellent down to um, any of the, the problems you may have. You can tell a lot by the kerf and it is the best way for you to judge that. So thank you for your attention today. Make sure you turn in those notes you took and we will see you next week in the lab when we give this a try. Thank you.